We're going to do some questions. Before we do some questions, I, I just want to um, share with you this that I found on the way over here today. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Not Solomon Steel, although I did, I did see Solomon Steel growing here. This is the famous um, tree from A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, the one that came up through the crack in the sidewalk, right? It's called Tree of Heaven or Ilanthus. And um, I showed a couple of people here. If you're not sure that this is Ilanthus, because this is one leaf, so it's a compound leaf, meaning it's made up of a bunch of leaflets. Other trees look like this, black walnut, some locust trees sometimes. If you crush it to express the volatile oils in the leaf and sniff it, it smells like peanut butter. It really does. Jiffy. Yeah, let's pass it around. Yeah, go ahead. Where did you learn all of this? <laughs> um, great question because it points to the fact that this knowledge is out there and available to you. I learned it um, through books largely and through experience and by seeking out anybody I could to teach me. So I have a, a wonderful teacher, Richard Mandelbaum. He's an herbalist. You may know him from the Arbor Vitae traditional school of herbalism that used to be in the city. And um, I would go walking with him once or twice a year even. Uh, I remember that I would be astonished. We would m meet at a destination and then we wouldn't leave the parking lot for like an hour because we were just talking about like a yard of, gr of ground and all the plants that were growing in it. So you seek out people to give you knowledge. You read books. You get curious. You follow your nose. And that's how you learn. That's how I learned. Hi. Um, there's something that I thought was interesting to compare foraging to hunting, because one way I found, uh, or one evolution in my understanding of hunting is that now hunters can work together to protect the land by uh, you know, bidding for licenses to hunt. Is there some way that foragers are sort of collaborating on land conservation, or how do they negotiate like the use of land? Fantastic question. Thanks for bringing it up. I could do a whole talk just on that. Um, the thing about foraging is that it's largely illegal. It's illegal to forage on state land, which makes me feel irate from one point of view. But from another point of view, if you see the um, lack of respect that we've been taught for the land, those laws are there for protection, right? So there's kind of two sides to that coin. So that's why I kind of dropped in casually that if you're going to forage, you should really read up on the rules and regulations. Um, but to answer your question more specifically, you know, there's lots of ways that foragers can work with the land in ways that are beneficial. One of those ways is to seek out, quote unquote, invasive plants. I like to call them introduced species. But we often have. Um, plants that were brought here either as ornamentals um, or by accident, and they're thriving in this climate, but they often will outcompete native species, um, which is problematic for a variety of reasons. I used to just be like, kumbaya, like the plants are here, they're innocent, everybody should just do their thing. And then I got a little bit more educated, and I realized that there's a lot of ways in which um, indigenous insect and animal life co-evolves with native plants. Um, and if you start losing native plants, it greatly affects the biodiversity. So, I mean, in the end, I do think that nature will strike the balance. Certainly, the window of um, time that we're looking at, like 100 years, is nothing. So the idea that we know, you know, what should be foraged or what should be planted or, you know, any of that kind of stuff is kind of ridiculous in, in, a, in the grand scheme of things. But the bottom line is, you know, in order to forage, if you want to find those chanterelles or those morels or whatever it is, you quickly understand that you have to come into relationship with the total ecology. Because mushrooms live in, in symbiotic relationships with certain trees. And 
they grow in certain seasons, and pretty soon you're learning to identify all the plants and understanding how things live together in harmony and seeing, you know, the fact that bears and foxes and all birds all eat blueberries too, so you can't go to that bush and take all the blueberries. I mean, it's a very complex and nuanced, um, which is why I, I'm very resistant to just teach foraging, because you can't just teach foraging, just like you can't just teach hunting, really. You have to understand the whole landscape and the interconnectedness of everything. That was kind of wordy. Did I answer you? If, if the person asking the question could take their mask down, I would really appreciate it. And also stand up when you asked a question, please. Kate, can you stand up when you asked a question? Thank you. Hi. Um, it's wonderful, Laura, thank you. Um, given that at a molecular level you could say everything is nature, what is your feeling about going into the urban environment and finding nature in the sort of ossified way? That's something that used to be a plant that has become ultimately, say, a brick. Can you find nature in where, the, where you can't find actual plants? Is there such a thing as a wilderness that is concrete? What a beautiful question, so poetic. Um, it, it's funny because one of my little tropes is, I like to say that we've created this false dichotomy. There's, there's the natural world, and then there's the world inhabited by humans, I guess. Those are the two things. But really, what? No, there's just one world, and we're all living in it together. So yes, of course, nature is everywhere. A lot of people during the pandemic would, would say to me, like, I can't even get outside. You know, hopefully, people at least had a window. And, and a window automatically connects you to nature. But I've read studies that say that even if you don't have a window, just looking at a, an artistic representation of nature is beneficial to your system. So, so I think what you're saying is that nature is everywhere, and I'm completely agreeing with you. I mean, from the linen smock I'm wearing to the juice I drank this morning to the weed I'm smoking, it's all nature, right? Yeah. Um, could you talk a bit about if there was a catalyst? It sounds like maybe you moved from the city to the country or um, like a place where nature is more accessible. Can you talk about if there was a catalyst to making that decision and making that move? Sure. We'll get a little personal, I guess. <laughs> um, what happened was I was living in LA um, in the early aughts. And um, the LA lifestyle, right, Jenny? My friend is here who used to hike with me a lot there. Um, I was married to a man who was dying of cancer. And I found that one of the few places I could find solace was hiking, hiking in the Palisades, one of my favorite places. And um, he ended up dying, and I ended up moving back to New York. And when I got back here, I was like, I, I got to find a place outside the city. Um, and so I ended up finding a little cottage in the Catskills, and that's how I, I first went up there. And then I was going back and forth for a few years. And then in 2009, my husband and I just decided to move up full time. So really, you know, I grew up in nature. I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, where the redwoods meet the ocean. and loved tide pooling and was really into being outside. And then I went super urban and I was like a Prada wearing creative director stomping the concrete in New York City for many years. So it really wasn't until I moved back to LA that I kind of re-engaged. And, and it was a, in a, out of a feeling of, of desperation and depletion and grief um, that I turned to, to nature. Anybody else? We have time for one more question. Make it good. Jane. <laughs> I was wondering, I've heard um, that we've overforaged ramps recently, like as it's become like a trendy thing in restaurants. Are there other plants that um, we're seeing the same trends with? Um, 
Yeah, the ramp question. That's always a good one. You know, it's really interesting because a ginseng um, grew very, very abundantly here in the Northeast. And in the 19th century, um, it was a very popular entrepreneurial business to go into. Harvesting ginseng was, a lot of it was being sent to Asia for medicinal use. And it was so over harvested that there's very, very little ginseng left. I've only ever seen it once in the wild. So it's not really something new, this ramp thing. You know, there's, there's always these crazes. In fact, when I was doing some research about ramps, I discovered that Chicago is a bastardization of the indigenous word for ramps, Chicago. And that Lake Michigan used to be completely ringed with ramps, no longer over harvested. So, you know, anything that becomes trendy, like chaga, um, is in danger of being over harvested. And, you know, I think our consciousness has been raised so much around things like supply chains and provenance. Um, so there's, you know, there's a greater awareness when you're buying something that you should understand if it was reputably sourced. Um, but I, I, think the, I think ramps are going to be OK in the Northeast. Um, actually, I, I, I know people that are planting their own ramp patches and kind of tending them in the way that I think the indigenous people probably did. So with a little bit of education, I think you know, we can bring back some of these plants and we can learn how to coexist with them in a way that doesn't damage their populations. Thanks, you guys.